Kevin Durant is under contract, staying with the Nets. But the key word that stood out with the press release was partnership. Brian Windhorst, ESPN senior NBA writer, kind enough to join us here. Am I making more out of one word here, Brian, than I should? It said the partnership with the two will move forward. <laughs> well, with this Nets team, I'm not sure. You know, I think they're probably right now going about week to week. Um, but <laughs> I think I think making any predictions or assumptions about this Nets team is going to be risky business. Um, but they came through the storm here uh, at the start of this offseason. Sean Marks it was one of the more aggressive press conferences I can remember in recent years. You know, he basically came out and and, you know, without calling out players names, basically said, we can't go forward like this with this team. We got to reset this uh, the way our team operates. And I was like, good luck to you. Because, you know, from the day that uh, KD and Kyrie Irving walked in, you basically, you know, gave them the, 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 key, the keys to the franchise and, and sort of let them have control. I don't know how you're getting it back. And the way that they have gotten through it, Dan, is leverage. You know, the, when, when, when those guys came there, they didn't have much leverage. The Nets were, you know, a borderline playoff team with no superstar players. And they were like, whatever it takes. You, wanna, you want us to sign DeAndre Jordan for $40 million? Okay. You want to potentially have a say in the coach. Okay. Um, and that, you know, giving them that kind of uh, rope, it didn't work. And so the team was like, well, we can't go forward with this. So how do you get, you know, now they've got the leverage. So number one, they knew that there wasn't a huge market for Kyrie Irving. Not that other teams didn't want him. It's just that nobody had money this summer. It wasn't a, a summer where there was a lot of cap space. And so they had to, you know, Kyrie at one point said, Hey, listen, I might opt out. Uh, or I might go to the Lakers and take a $30 million pay cut. It seemed crazy, but you know, they had to, they had to, to go to bed at night thinking about that. Um, they had Kyrie saying, Hey, I, I want to work out a sign and trade. Give me permission to go talk to other teams. And they go, okay, go do that. They knew that the, the leverage was in their favor there and they won that one. And then when Durant said, I, I want to be traded, you know, they knew that they had a four-year contract in their favor and they had to probably swallow some Pepto. Um, more sleepless nights. But when they talked with other teams, Dan, and those teams made offers, they were like, no, we're, we're trading you a, su a superstar player on a four-year contract. We're not backing down. And so even when two weeks ago, Durant asked for, for Marks and Steve Nash to be fired, obviously on its face, that was extremely disconcerting. <laughs> um, but if you could peel back the initial shock layer, there was Durant saying underneath there, there's a path to me coming back and, and rescinding this. It was a pretty extreme path. And they kept their nerve because they had the leverage. And ultimately, the leverage played off. Will it continue to pay off for the next nine months? I guess we'll wait and see. Okay, but I can't imagine that first meeting between Kyrie, KD, and Steve Nash. I mean, is Steve Nash safe? Okay, so I do think it was a remarkable step that Steve Nash, and I mean, this is a, I know Steve a little bit. This is a proud man. Um, this is a, a relentless competitor. We all saw him in his career. I mean, this is a guy who, you know, through the back part, a couple of years of his career, couldn't play without laying down on the court to deal with his back injuries. And he just played through it. I mean, this is not a guy who gets pushed around. But he flew to LA this week or whatever it was, I guess, uh, you know, two days ago. And he sat in the room with KD. And I'll say to you, I'll say this, Dan, I've covered the NBA for 20 years. You've seen more NBA seasons than I have. I have seen situations where a coach gets threatened by a star player, gets the backing of management, and becomes emboldened. Where they're like, okay, now, I, now you know that you can't get to me. And it actually works. I'll give you an example right off the bat. LeBron James' first year in Miami. They start nine and eight. He, uh, you know, they could debate how much he and the rest of those guys wanted Eric Spolstra to step aside and Pat Riley to come in. Riley put him right back in their place, back Spolstra. And I remember being there the day after, it, you know, the stories came out that LeBron wanted Spolstra fired. I thought we might see like a tentative Eric Spolstra. He was absolutely as strong as he's ever been. Obviously, there's been times where the star doesn't like the coach and it doesn't work. 
But I actually think they may have given the franchise reset a chance to work here because they use their leverage against these two guys. And whatever was said in that room between Durant and Nash, in theory, carries over to the start of training camp. I, I can't believe I'm saying these words. And I'm certainly not running down to place a bet on the Nets championship. I'm cautiously optimistic about the Nets now because I like their roster. And I think this might have cleared out some scar tissue. And I think they got a chance now. What's this mean for Kyrie in Brooklyn? He has an incredible incentive to have a low stress, great season. He has seen that his windows to leave Brooklyn are not that open. Now, there's a lot more cap space next summer than there is this summer. He'll have more options. Um, uh, But uh, he has never been sort of under this kind of scrutiny before. He has got one year on his contract, and he needs to prove that it's going to work. And so I don't know if Kyrie has it in him to be consistently focused on basketball and to deliver the way the Nets need him to do it, he may not have it. He he may be at a point where he, he, you know, you know, we obviously know that on individual nights he can be spectacular, but if it's ever going to happen, it's going to happen in this situation. I think the Nets have put themselves in the best chance to succeed with this Kyrie that, that they could. And it doesn't mean that it will, but I think there's a level of buy-in now buy-in in the summer and buy-in in January, two different things, but I, I do think there's a level of buy-in. And the one thing I also will say, throughout this entire process, we've never seen any indications of Durant and Kyrie splintering. In fact, if anything, I think Durant has been too loyal to Kyrie. So ultimately, whatever Steve Nash is doing takes back seat to the way those two operate together. And I will say that Ben Simmons is one of the great mysteries in the entire NBA. You can tell me that Ben Simmons is going to give them nothing this year, and I would say that's possible. You could also tell me that they're going to deploy a lineup with Ben Simmons playing center, Joe Harris and Seth Curry playing shooting positions with with uh, with uh, Kyrie and Durant, and you could see an incredibly talk. You know, you talk about the death lineup that the Warriors used to run. That's the death lineup on steroids. That th- 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 I would be incredible. I'm not saying they're going to play at 30 minutes a game. That would be incredible. I don't know whether Ben Simmons can manage it, but you know, there's all of a sudden a whole bunch of different things this team can do that has me thinking about them in basketball terms instead of what's going to happen with their star players. Talking to Brian Windhorst, ESPN senior NBA writer. If I said Ben Simmons will be an all-star over the next four years or be out of basketball after four years, what would you bet on? I'd bet on him being an all-star because I think – there is a path for him to be successful in the NBA. And uh, he doesn't have to be a superstar on this team. He doesn't have to make shots. Seriously, Dan, he could go through the entire season and not shoot a ball outside the paint, and it would be okay. If he defends, which is what the Nets need, if he's able to be a, a significant defender, and like if they build, I mean, I am not an X and O strategist, but I can tell you that, if you build an offense where you would have a six foot ten Ben Simmons operating the offense out of the post with those four type of playmakers, I can see it working. I can see there being a role here where he can be a star in that role. Um, again, I, I'm not wagering on him making the All Star team this year, but I can see it. And also, and I was saying this for the last couple of months, and it felt weird when I said it, but I'll say it again: the Nets kind of had a good off season. They, 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 they traded for Royce O'Neal, who's exactly the type of player that they need. And they got him, in my mind, for cheap. They got him for a, a protected future first-round pick. They signed TJ Warren, who hasn't played in two years, but it's a very low-risk, high-reward type signing. They re-signed Patty Mills. And Joe Harris and Seth Curry both had off-season surgeries. And again, in theory, you know, you got, you, you got, you got some guys coming off surgery here, but in theory, all of those guys will be healthier. There's a lot there that I am think could be fertile for Ben Simmons to work with. Yeah, maybe Ben can be a Draymond Green type of point forward for this team, although Draymond can still you know, occasionally knock down a three-pointer. 
the the Lakers offseason. LeBron signs the extension. Looks like they're not getting Kyrie. Are they ready to go into battle with this roster that they have right now? They shouldn't be. Um, you know, I would I would guess that at some point they're going to make a significant trade. It may not be before the start of the season. It may be later on, and it's probably going to involve Westbrook. The real question is, what what is the demeanor of of Russ going to be? Because the exit interview that he gave at the end of last season was extremely troubling. It made me wonder how they ever thought it would work. Unless he completely did an about face in what he said, it sounded to me like he was never invested in this success. And so Darvin Ham heard that exit interview before he took the job and almost, almost his first order of business when he got the job after signing his contract was publicly laying out exactly what he needed Russell Westbrook to do. Now, I have seen things happen in the NBA. I am not going to sit here and tell you that what he wants Russell Westbrook to do, which is to be a defensive role player and to be a screen setter and stand in the corner and wait for the ball to come to him and, and make a shot, uh, <laughs> you know, one out of every seven possessions. I'm not going to sit here and say that it is zero chance of that because I've seen stuff in the NBA. But the, the tenor of the way Russ was talking throughout last season, what I know about him as a person and as a player, I find it very doubtful he is, a, he is going to actually be able to follow through with that. So the question is, how long are they going to experiment with that, Dan? Are they going to experiment with that the first 10 days of training camp? Are they going to do it in their you know, four or five preseason games? Are they going to spend October and November experimenting with that? And if it doesn't work, how much damage is there? Because when you look at the Western Conference, let's just be reasonable. The Lakers finished 11th last year. I know they had injuries, but teams have injuries. You know, you're going to assume that a 37 and 38 year old player is going to miss games in LeBron, and you're going to assume Anthony Davis is going to miss games. If you don't assume that, you haven't watched his career. So they finished 11th last year. Which teams are they passing that finished ahead of them? Okay, Utah's coming backwards. I'll give them that. San Antonio, who finished one spot ahead of him in 10th, is coming backwards. Okay. I'll give them that they can pass those two teams. By the way, Portland's standing right next to them. They're getting Damian Lillard back. They've upgraded their team. Sacramento Kings, I can't believe I'm talking about this, but they've got a shot to make the play-in <laughs> tournament. Okay, they've improved their roster. Yep. Who are the Lakers passing with this current team? They're not passing very many teams. And that's why when you look at their roster and you say they're a play-in team at best, you know that, that offends some Lakers fans, but that's just a fair way to look at it. I think from the trade standpoint, which is everybody wants to know, well, what trade are they going to make? I think based on me talking to some teams out there, I think they are going to be willing to trade those two first round picks, but they're not going to be willing to trade those two first round picks just to get off of Russell Westbrook or to potentially improve themselves from projected ninth to projected seventh. They're going to use that to try to leap up, which is why they were instantaneously interested in Kyrie Irving. And whether or not a trade like that presents itself is going to depend on whether how far they're going to be willing to go into those assets. I'll leave you with this. Donovan Mitchell, uh, you know, obviously it's not a secret, but it's been quiet. Uh, it feels like uh, Cleveland's maybe involved in this or another team's involved in this. I don't know if that's meant as, you know, kind of getting the Knicks to step back up here with Danny Ainge, but is Donovan Mitchell on another roster? opening night. I I would be very surprised if he is uh, with the jazz after the trade deadline uh, opening night. We'll see. Um, there's a, when you talk to executives in the league, including some teams that have talked to the jazz, they will say nobody can probably beat what the Knicks can offer. And that this entire thing is a dance to okay. get the Knicks to a price that the jazz want. Um, the Knicks, I think, are in a position where they know that and they're not going to try to bid against themselves. And the X factor that we don't understand here, and by the way, like I do think there's other teams who have made offers and I do think that there are other offers that the Jazz would consider, but I don't think there's a better offer out there that they're going to take in lieu of what they can get from the Knicks. And they're certainly not going to do that six months before the trade deadline. That just doesn't, that's just bad business. But one thing we don't know 
the Jazz are going to tank this year. It seems like that's what they want to do. If they start the season with Donovan Mitchell, Mike Conley, Bogdan Bogdanovich, Pat Beverly on the roster, I mean, that's not a playoff team, but they are not going to go 2-15. and They're going to win some games, and I don't expect Donovan Mitchell to play 15 minutes and take eight shots. I expect him to go for the scoring title. Why wouldn't he? You know, why wouldn't he see what Russell Westbrook did when he won MVP after Durant left and go, I'm, I'm going for it. So the question is, how worried are the Jazz about maybe a missed opportunity by not going into full tank, leaning into a full tank situation? And would that cause any sense of urgency for them to want to do that before the start of opening day? The Knicks seem, the way they're the Knicks are handling this, they're not going to come in and just blow everybody away with offers. They seem like they want a hard line. So I guess we'll see. There is definitely a game being played out there with information right now. And I, I kind of see, I don't have all the information, but I kind of see where things are being dropped and leaked and saying, you know, boy, we really love this other offer. We really love it. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, you know, since I have no skin in the game, it's easy for me to smile as I watch it. But it's going to be a massive transaction. Whether the Knicks do the deal or not, it potentially could define their next couple seasons. Always great to talk to you, Brian. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Dan. Have a good day. That's Brian Windhorst, ESPN senior NBA writer.